Hello and welcome, my name is Meeplelis, they, she, he, and this is Literally Graphic. And today I'll be reporting back on my somewhat lackluster first quarter of 2022 not comics reading. Much like last quarter, I read a total of 21 books, with 8 counting towards my reading goal. The average page length was 272 pages, the average publication date was 2014, and my average rating dropped ever so slightly to 4 stars. Starting with my lowest rated not goal books this quarter, because they have been my junk food of choice so far this year, I have already read two Witcher novels in 2022, including both The Sword of Destiny and The Blood of Elves, both of which I ended up rating two out of five stars. Because while I will certainly admit to enjoying them on a number of levels, the way the female characters were generally written left a lot to be desired. The other book I ended up rating two stars was The Art of Gathering, How We Meet and Why It Matters by Priya Parker. I was initially turned on to this book while I was watching a video on grassroots conflict resolution. I decided to try and follow up with each contributor and my library happened to have Parker's book on audio. A couple of issues with the book were more on me than on the book, namely that I ended up having to return it halfway through and didn't get it back for a good six months. Secondly, it did end up being more about business class gathering and conflict, which made it a bit hard to connect with personally. The big issue that I took with the book itself was in the final third when Parker decided to try and tackle students protesting speakers being hosted at universities. Like many other people, after all that discussion of productive conflict and coming together, students protesting is just too much. It is a black and white issue and students are 100% in the wrong. Frankly, I find this idea from her, and in news reporting in general, to be absolutely ridiculous, ignoring for a moment all the kinds of reprehensible, racist, and bigoted ideas that get bandied around by speakers who make a big deal about being protested. Students have as much right to free speech as speakers. Protesting speakers is part of the dialogue. So yeah, that felt a bit dated and picked at a pet peeve of mine. Moving along to three stars... For my knuckle reading, we ended up with just In the Shadow of Liberty by Kenneth C. Davis. This nonfiction title outlines the lives of a number of slaves that belonged to early American presidents. I appreciated the way this highlights a largely brushed over part of history. At least when it came to my education, there was very little emphasis on how some early presidents owned slaves and others did not, the lengths some presidents went to recapture slaves, and even the fact that Thomas Jefferson, among others, raped their slaves and traded in the flesh of their kin. Stars were subtracted for not necessarily going as hard as they could on slave owners, and some of the ways this was packaged as why it didn't work for me. That said, it was an interesting follow-up after I finished They Were Her Property, which I'll touch on in just a minute. Looking at four-star reads that didn't fit into my goals, we can start off with The Last by Catherine Applegate part of her Endling trilogy. The first book I finished this year, and my first middle grade novel in a while, I picked this book up because I've been listening to the podcast Animorphs Anonymous to relive that series without actually reading it, and I haven't completely caught up, but now they have moved on to books I haven't already read. So now I feel like I must read them. Ended up being pretty charmed by this book, original in some ways, trope-filled in the best way in others, I thought it did a good job of introducing a lot of ideas about the nature of truth without being a PSA. I also liked how the story feels informed by modern understandings of human-induced climate change. I'll definitely be picking up book two soon. The second not-goal read I ended up reading this quarter and rating four stars was In the City of Dirty Water, a memoir of healing by Clayton Thomas Mueller, which follows Clayton through his life, much of it in Winnipeg, the child of residential school survivors, the trauma inflicted by these church-slash-government institutions reverberates through Clayton's life, even as he reconnects with his Cree heritage and works for 20 years organizing environmental campaigns. Very interesting read. And the final four-star knock read was What Strange Paradise by Omar L. Akkad. 
I picked up this and The City of Dirty Water because they were both finalists in the latest run of Canada Reads. If you're interested in a very short annual reality TV style competition revolving around books, this might be your thing. But circling back to What Strange Paradise, a novel that follows the journey of immigrants and refugees. A solid read, although I would rate American Civil War slightly higher. Finishing up with my five star knockable cool reads, we have a number. First out of the gate was Unreconciled Family, Truth, and Indigenous Resistance by Jesse Wenty. Someone who I've been following for a while, I appreciated getting to know Wenty better and hearing his perspective in this quote, part memoir and part manifesto. Important read for myself and all my settler peers across so-called North America. Wente doesn't pull punches. Then I read The Strangers by Katharina Vermet, a follow-up to her well-received debut novel, The Break. Another powerful read that shows the riches and humanity of the indigenous community, and specifically the Métis community, in the face of the genocidal violence of Canada a theme that ran through a lot of my reading this quarter. As I also rated Five Little Indians by Michelle Good, five out of five stars, a novel that follows five residential school survivors in the Vancouver Lower East Side and winner of Canada Reads 2022. I also started reading substantially more poetry this quarter, mostly still an audiobook. I rated If They Come For Us by Fatima Asghar and Witness I Am by Gregory Schofield, five out of five stars. A lot of hard truth, boiled down into extremely potent words. I also ended up picking up We Do This Till We Free Us, Abolitionist Organizing and Transforming Justice by Miriam Kaba, a collection of essays, articles, and interviews about how we move towards abolition. This is a movement I have a lot of interest in, even if I still have a lot to learn. A lot of people in my life have been negatively impacted by the carceral system as it stands, and the whole thing seems unsustainable to say the least. So yeah, we should all be learning more about how to live in communities safely. Then I read They Were Her Property by Stephanie E. Jones Rogers, a nonfiction book that really delved into the ways that white women participated in slavery. As a group, white women have gotten a large pass when it came to discussions of the brutality of slave owning because people think that women automatically are more moral and gentle than men. This is obviously extremely false. Trying to summarize the book any further isn't doing it any justice, so I would encourage all my non-black peers to just pick this book up. Which concludes my not comic and not goal reading for this quarter. I also spent a significant amount of time listening to Capital, Volume 1, but I haven't quite finished that yet, so you will have to wait in anticipation for my thoughts on that front. So as I talked about in my New Year's Goals video, my goal this year is to focus on reading 30 books by authors from Oceania, Pacific Islands, and the islands of Southeast Asia. Because I was a stupid American and thought they were part of Oceania when I focused on reading books by authors from across Asia. I'm a bit behind my goal of reading three books a month, but not as much as I originally feared. And these things do tend to go in waves. Starting with the lowest rated goal read this quarter, Does My Head Look Big in This by Rhonda Abdel Fattah, a young adult contemporary book, was a young adult contemporary book that has been on my TBR for some time. I found it to be pretty entertaining, if not particularly up my alley. I rated it three out of five stars. I also rated Harold the Ninth by Tamsin Muir, three out of five stars, because while I did find it really interesting and entertaining, I had a very difficult time following along with where the plot was going. I am hoping to track down an explainer video one of these days. Moving up a star, I had three four-star goal reads this quarter. First out of the gate was Rabbit Proof Fence, the true story of one of the greatest escapes of all time by Doris Pilkington and Nugi Garamara. Quote, following an Australian government edict in 1931, black Aboriginal children and children of mixed marriages were gathered up by whites and taken to settlements to be assimilated. In Rabbit Proof Fence, award-winning author Doris Pilkerton traces the captivating story of her mother, Molly, one of three young girls uprooted from their community in southwestern Australia and taken to the more River Native Settlement. At the settlement, Millie and her relatives, Gracie and Daisy, were forbidden to speak their native language, forced to abandon their Aboriginal heritage, and taught to be culturally white. After regular stays in solitary confinement, the three girls, scared and homesick, planned and executed a daring escape from the Grin Camp with its harsh life of padlocks, barred windows, and hard cold beds. End quote. Next was The Yield by Tara June Winch. Quote, knowing that he will soon die, Albert Poppy Gondawindi takes pen to paper, 
His life has been spent on the banks of the Murumbi River at Prosperous House on Massacre Plains. Albert is determined to pass on the language of his people, and everything that was ever remembered finds the words on the wind. End quote. And then I picked up The Whale Rider by Witi Ihimaria. Quote, Eight-year-old Kahu craves her great-grandfather's love and attention, but he's focused on his duties as chief of the Maori in Wangara, New Zealand, a tribe that claims descent from the legendary whale rider. In every generation since the whale rider, a male has inherited the title of chief, but now there is no male heir. There's only Kahu. She should be next in line for the title, but her great-grandfather is blinded by tradition and sees no use for a girl. End quote. I should try picking up the movie sometime soon. To conclude, my five-star goal reads started with Firefront, First Nations Poetry and Power Today, a collection of various Aboriginal poetry from Australia. I actually read this one with my eyeballs. It was nice to be able to see some work by people who were coming up in my search for Oceania authors, but who my library didn't carry individually. And I also rated Phantom Pains by Teresa Estesian, a bit of a random pick that turned out to be extremely interesting. Quote, Teresa Estesian survived a rare infection that nearly killed her, but not without losing both her legs below the knees, several fingers, and reproductive. Phantom Pains is a visceral, imaginative collection exploring disability, grief, and life by interweaving stark memories with magic surrealism. End quote. And that ends my highlights of what I read this quarter. I did some note-taking on the first couple of books I read this year, but still ended up having to wing a bunch of it. This quarter I get to start again from scratch, so that's nice. And maybe I'll be a bit more successful this time. On to the stats. Like I experimented with last year, we will be comparing this quarter's stats with last quarter and last year. Kicking things off with my goal, not goal reading, I did end up reading eight titles this quarter for my final goal, which is pretty much on target. And considering how few books I read in total, it is actually a higher percentage of my reads this past quarter than usual. Looking at the breakdown of series versus standalone, I'm sticking to my average, which is largely standalone. I try and only get into series that I think I will really like or serve a purpose, as I do feel a lot of pressure to finish things. Looking at genre, poetry has certainly jumped much further ahead than usual. I read about twice as much SFF this quarter than last, which is always nice. And I certainly do not mind not reading as much contemporary as a result. Not that I dislike contemporary, but it's certainly a tad less exciting on average. Moving on to a new to me stat, I started this year reading a middle grade novel, so I decided to start tracking that demographic information. That said, I have not had the mental stamina yet to go back and figure out that stat for quarters past, so I don't have anything to compare to yet. Unsurprisingly, I read mostly adult books. Next up, I will usually be talking about how many books by Marxist leftists I read the, in a quarter. As I already mentioned, I have actually been working my way through Das Kapital, but otherwise, while I certainly read some books by people that appear to be on the leftist side of things, I didn't run into the labels of communist or anarchist. Although, yeah, feeling pretty lethargic this quarter, so I won't be surprised if I miss something. Thankfully, I managed to avoid this critical failure on the disability, neurodiverse, deaf, and or chronic illness intersecting front. I read one book by a disabled author. I will certainly try to bulk that up next quarter. Social construct of race in my place. Wise, there were some changes to the individual breakdown of authors. I read fewer black authors this quarter, but also fewer white authors than last year. Lots of indigenous authors, surprise, surprise, and more POC authors than last year. Maybe due to lack of research and maybe just an actual fluke, but I am surprised by how many people I read this quarter who I put under the religion unknown category. Totally valid, just surprised. Glad that at the very least, that obvious Christianity didn't sneak in as the only religious rep. Uh, looking at gender, a bit sad. It looks so binary, but could be worse. Plus, I didn't read any trans authors this quarter. Sad day. Sexuality isn't that different. But I should try and kick it up a few notches next quarter. Another new stat I'm tracking this quarter is if a book is translated or not. So far, I've only found two, and that was The Witcher. Classy. Looking at the countries and people groups that I read books from, I was surprised that can lit outstripped American lit. I wasn't even trying. Otherwise, nothing too surprising. I did decide to condense all the groups that I only read one book from 
for the sake of a coherent graph. But to list them off, I read one book by an Ojibwe author, a Maori author, one from an author connected to Pakistan, another one connected to Palestine, one connected to the Philippines, and one by a Wurundjeri author, which concludes our stats portion. But before we conclude entirely, I wasn't sure if I had a podcast that was helping me avoid reading any books this quarter, but I think that working class literature counts. Much more sporadic partner to the Working Class History Podcast, the lit version did some pretty interesting episodes in March about Michael Rosen's socialist fairy tales. Would recommend. Bye y'all, keep reading, and organize to end capitalist oppression. And as always, Literally Graphic is recorded on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat Nation. I live here because of British colonization, indigenous genocide, and more geographically specific, Treaty 13, also known as the Toronto Purchase, which was finalized in 1805 between representatives of the Crown and certain Mississauga peoples. This treaty was a lie and has since been broken many times over. Saying so reflects only my own small steps towards knowing the truth and does nothing for reconciliation.